Uh, and then for more of the market perspective, we're joined now by Michael Collins, PGM Fixed Income Senior Portfolio Manager, and David Bonson of the Bonson Group, uh, founder and CIO. Uh, guys, we have a really cool chart that I'll describe to you that shows uh, the hit to net income in many countries uh, across the world versus what uh, the fiscal stimulus is going to be. And it seems like developed markets are actually okay that we're making up the net income, but it's emerging markets that can't. Uh, David Bonson, how do you look at that? Well, I think that there is going to be a disproportionate impact in a lot of the emerging markets, but I wouldn't look at emerging markets in this case monolithically either. I think that individual emerging markets are going to be impacted differently depending on their contribution to global growth cyclicality, their commodity dependency, and their role as an exporter versus um, a, a different sort of economic framework. So in other words, China and Taiwan and South Korea and Hong Kong are going to have very different attributes than parts of South America and other parts of Southeast Asia. And what also we got last week, uh, David, was the um, increase in equity prices over three days. And some say, oh, okay, maybe that was portfolio rebalancing for pension funds into the end of the quarter. But did you learn anything, David, in when we do have a recovery, what you need to be invested in? Well, I, I'm not sure that I learned from the market rallying what we need to be invested in. I think what people need to be invested in is what they believe represents good investment opportunity where there's values that are most dislocated. I, I vehemently disagree with this idea that last week's rally was portfolio rebalancing. And, I, and I'm a little confused why that becomes the issue um, if it's the 31st of the month or the 30th of the month or now apparently the 23rd of the month. we we can And then on the Friday, they were done rebalancing. Uh, the fact of the matter is that markets are clearly showing you that they don't need a reason to do what they're going to do day by day. When markets are going up a thousand and down a thousand every day, there is not a logical explanation. It's just hyper volatility. And, and that's going to be the uh, overall all environment that we're in for some time. I think primarily it's what he just said. Spreads came in a lot, particularly in investment grade corporates and agency mortgage backs. It's an important distinction I'd make. He's right that spreads really tightened in agencies, but in the non-agency space, the uh, other residential mortgage back and especially commercial mortgage back, they remain very, very wide. So last week you saw equities improve in concert with some of that normal see coming back into credit markets. There's still a long way to go there, though. Uh, so it seems like what you're saying, David, is you, you're not taking on any risk at all. So how do what do you do right now? Well, we're definitely taking on risk. I mean, we have maintained our positioning and we're, we can't as, uh, rebalance into equities the way we want because we couldn't sell bonds the way we wanted. Municipal bonds and high grade corporates were totally broken until a few days ago. So that's the issue is how do you rebalance when you can't get cash out of another asset class at an at a optimal level? That's starting to change. I think it will feed the ability to rebalance. And the question becomes, for some clients, do we go all into rebalancing, really put our whole equity position where we want it to be, or do we tether that rebalance in? And I think that's a client by client decision from risk appetite mm -hmm. and timeline and things like that. But we definitely have kept risk on. It's just that with the uncertainty still out there, we're not in a rush to go all in on a particular thesis. We want to kind of take our time yeah. uh, slowly allocating equities back up to their target allocation because equities are clearly underweight for anybody after this month. Oil plunging to a 17-year low, WTI dipping below $20 a barrel. Uh, still with me, Michael Collins of PGM and David Bonson of the Bonson Group. Uh, David, when you have oil like this, how does that filter through to other asset classes? Uh, it's pretty heavily correlated right now, particularly in high yield credit spreads. And then obviously on the equity side with the, the stocks that are most primarily in that sector. And so there is a, that degree of correlation. Interestingly, there were a couple of days last week where uh, oil prices were higher as, as equities were lower and vice versa. Um, you had uh, oil not participate on or at least one of the big equity up days. So it may not be a day to day correlation with oil and stocks, but I do think that it speaks to the risk on risk off paradigm. And you're going to see it in high yield credit spreads, which is certainly the area that has not begun to improve. And I suspect that you'll see high yield spreads start to tighten right around the time you see oil into the higher 20s mm. as opposed to lower 20s.
Uh, David Bonson, when you take a look at, say, value, for example, I mean, a lot of the, some of these companies aren't going to go bankrupt altogether. Like, there's still going to be a Delta, right? There's still be a Chevron. When do you know and what do you know how to buy in this group? Well, I, I don't think you can be completely tied to timing the exact bottom. I think you have to be able to look to those issues of balance sheet strength. I mean, it's a completely different category when you're talking about a Chevron versus a weaker credit energy player. Uh, there's plenty of names there that are not unscathed by what's happening, but they certainly have the financial wherewithal to come out on the other side. So the airlines and the uh, cruise ships and those types of businesses have a much different um, characteristic in this environment and also a different relationship to the government stimulus bill. I mean, they're, they're going to have more direct financing and, and you know, benefits out of that program than some of the others. Our, our bias, as you know, Alex, is always dividend growth companies and generally dividend growth companies that, that qualified to be in our portfolio got that way because they have balance sheet strength and less cyclicality. There's some that are certainly at a higher risk level now. I looked at Chevron and Exxon and I go back over the decades upon decades that they've maintained their dividend and in fact grown the dividend. And I do not think that they are experiencing a stress now that's even even worse than in the past. But that presupposes 20 to $25 oil being here for a short period of time. And that mean, is still my position. I, I think there are things happening behind the scenes, both with Saudi and with Putin, uh, that the U.S. is driving that are going to change that dynamic. But as long as oil is sitting here in the low 20s, it's very difficult to feel constructive on the space. You're going to have to see the supply side uh, lead the demand side because we know demand is going to be constricted at least for a couple months.